Uh, again, everyone is sinful, and so then the other topic that is not covered is grace. Um, and we have to name how that goes, how that works, and we understand that to be. Uh, we could discuss grace and its various definitions for an entire class. That's probably a good class to have at some point. I'm going to give you the most basic understanding of grace. Grace, in simple terms for this class, is the unmerited mercy and love of God. That is, we're sinful and broken creatures, and God loves us and cares for us and wants to be in relationship us, with us anyway. Um, and so God could have allowed us to continue in sin, but has repeatedly uh, come to our aid uh, because God loves us. So, with that in mind, last week we looked at substitutionary atonement theory for those who missed, and we're going to put these up on the web eventually. Um, but if you missed last week, a quick overview, um, Archbishop of Canterbury, that's what ABC stands for. The Archbishop of Can Canterbury Anselm was trying to teach how Jesus saved, so he created an idea based on feudal Europe. Um, that was, we are like serfs, we are like um, the peasants living on the uh, Lord's manor on his land. Uh, the, in the feudal system, the Lord owned the land, they owned the sea, they owned everything. Um, pretty much owned the, the labor as well. They were half a step above slaves. Um, so they owed everything. The, uh, you, if you were a serf, you owed everything to the Lord of the manor. And so in the same way, we owe everything to God. We didn't make this world. We didn't even make um, ourselves. Everything belongs to God in that same kind of idea. And here's how Anselm explained it. If we have offended our God... We have offended our Lord. We've offended God's honor, and there's nothing we can do to pay back that debt because everything was a gift in the first place, so how can we give back something that's already a gift? In the first place, we can't make amends for that, so we already owe everything. As a result, we need someone else to pay the debt for us, um, to pay that debt, that punishment we owe to restore the Lord's honor, um, and it, this is all very much an honor system, and it's very clear, we need a name for Anselm's sake. He had this idea of, sh of honoring, of God's honor, and restoring God's honor. It did not get into punishment until later iterations. Um, this idea of restoring God's honor was just to say that we have dishonored God. We've not caused permanent and eternal injury to God, but we've just dishonored that relationship. And how do we get back in good relationship? How do we honor God again? Um, and the way that happens in Anselm's reasoning is Jesus honors God by following God's will from his birth all the way through his crucifixion and resurrection. And this overflow of honor by God, by Jesus showing us how to live a godly life and then paying that debt, um, he takes away any punishment, any retribution um, that might happen because it is an overflow of honor. We are thus reconciled to God. Atonement theory. Um, so Anselm taught his theory in the book Cur Dies Homo, which is why God a man or why did God become a man? Thomas Aquinas in turn finessed the theory a little bit further into what is ultimately the dogma of the Catholic Church. Um, this is their main theory for atonement that Anselm has very clearly. And Aquinas shifted the focus from Anselm's honor ode to sin. He while Anselm talked about how we had dishonored God, Aquinas tweaked it and said, no, we've sinned against God. And so he, he upped the ante a little bit to talk about how then we are in turn saved from hell or that punishment that we are due because of our sinfulness. Okay. So um, Jesus becomes our substitute, atoning for our sins so we can reconcile to God. Hence, the whole idea of this is substitutionary atonement theory. That's the idea behind this. There are a couple of major issues we talked about last time. Why does God demand a blood sacrifice? Is God bloodthirsty? Why can't he just forgive our sins? Um, and it may, the problem with this theory is effectively that God demands blood sacrifice, really demands the death of his own son, which is a pretty harsh um, declaration by God in substitutionary atonement theory. Um, when it turns, in ter when turn, when... Um, John Calvin turns into what's called penal substitutionary atonement theory, where he talks about not just that it is um, Jesus is our substitute and pays for our sins, but 
Elvin takes it to another level and says it's like a legal case that you've already lost. Um, and the only way is someone has to pay for uh, the judgment against you. That's a little bit more of probably what we've here in the South a lot of times. And it's renamed penal substitutionary atonement theory because it gets much more into that Jesus had to pay for your sins um, instead of just restoring God's honor or just paying for our brokenness and showing us a better way. It becomes much more in that um, suffering is valorized. So, again, this is where the shadow side of this, this argument accepts violence and suffering as a part of God's plan. Um, even more, it's raised up as sacred and holy because Jesus suffered, so we too suffer. Because God demanded Jesus suffer for our sins, we should also be ready to suffer for the things that happen in our lives. Um, plus, if God's willing to kill his son, then we should suffer as well. Abuse, violence, all sorts of horrible things have been justified by the church. Because if Jesus was willing to accept sacrifice and suffering, then we too should be ready to accept that sacrifice and suffering in a wide variety of ways. Um, that are not at all scriptural or helpful, but it's how this theory has gotten twisted over the centuries. Um, it also uh, admits, it means that the only the cross matters. Easter doesn't matter. Teaching is an essential. Jesus' teaching and preaching is not as important just as pain for the sins. It's all the cross. Um, that's what we talked about last week for those who weren't able to make it into that and engage. So Anselm of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, taught this theory of atonement around 1100 A.D., uh, when the book was published. And then, pretty quickly, Peter Abelard, a French philosopher and theologian, crafted a response. There was an immediate response. And even Anselm pointed out problems with his theories at time. He didn't like how God was portrayed as bloodthirsty or angry. Um, Abelard took it a step further. So while Anselm focused on God's judgment and the debts owed, Peter sought a new way. Now, just a quick overview. Who is Peter Abelard, or in French, Pierre Abelard? Um, and that, my French is horrible, so I apologize for that. <laughs> he was born in Brittany near uh, Nantes in 1079. And Peter wandered France and debated the issues of the day. He was a brilliant man by any estimation. He became a student of, uh, I'm going to say Rosalinas, but I am probably completely wrong. I'm butchering it. Uh, who later was accused of heresy by Anselm. So he became a student of another guy who had some avant-garde theories. Um, and Abelard taught in the school at Notre Dame, and this was true for most of the cathedrals in the Middle Ages, um, that they all had big schools associated with them. They were centers of learning as well as enormous buildings and, and beautiful places. They had these schools that were often... Uh, Major, basically, they were universities before universities. So, um, Peter uh, comes in and he learns, and he's learning from William and Rosalinus. And he, Peter was a very smart guy, but he also was not a really, um, he wasn't a good people person. He loved debating so much that he liked to humiliate whoever he was debating, and it was not really an endearing characteristic. Uh, people got really mad at him because he would not just beat William or Rosalinus, he would humiliate them um, in debates, and it did not make him a beloved figure in the community. So Peter Abelard, who became famous and rich, teaching and preaching in Notre Dame, uh, met a woman named Eloise, who is brilliant in her own right. She was a well-educated woman, which was a a novel thing in those days. She wrote in Greek and Latin and spoke at least four, maybe five languages. And the two of them, as you might be able to guess, quickly fell in love. Oh my goodness, what happened here? Oh, <laughs> hold on, I gotta go back. I clicked the hyperlink there. <laughs> no, nah, there we are. All right, so, uh, the love affair that ensued became a legend in France. It was the legend of Peter and Eloise, or Abelard and Eloise, if you've heard of it. Um, there's lots of love poems and poetry because it is really sort of, it's not sort of, it is the French answer to Romeo and Juliet. Uh, it is this tragic tale of two brilliant young people who fall in love and are torn apart. 
Eloise became pregnant and gave him a son, gave uh, Abelard a son and named him Astrolab, which is a terrible name by any estimation. It, the, it's actually an instrument to measure the stars. That's the picture there next to it. I, I wouldn't suggest that if you're thinking of uh, names for children or grandchildren. It's a pretty terrible name. Um, but they were married in secret, um, and to protect her, Peter and Eloise had Eloise moved to a nunnery. So it's not super clear if the marriage happened before the pregnancy. It doesn't seem like it did. It probably happened after, but it was a mild scandal. And to protect her, Peter said, all right, let's, let's hide you in a nunnery, and that way um, we'll still be in love, and I can come and get you as soon as things die down and things become less concerned. Unfortunately, Eloise protector and overseer, Canon Fulbright, that is, a canon is one of the leaders of the cathedral, uh, was her uncle, um, did not approve this situation, and he did not get the message that they had gotten married. He didn't know anything had happened. He thought that basically Peter Abelard had just gotten his niece pregnant and then sent her off to a nunnery and shamed and disgraced her. Uh, to protect his honor and Eloise's honor, Fulbright hired men to castrate Peter Abelard, which didn't happen. Um, humiliated, Peter Abelard became a monk, and then ultimately Eloise, who was really just hiding in a nunnery, took the veil of a nun because they could no longer uh, be married and be in love. And so all of this is sort of the Greek, not Greek, the French tragic story of love thwarted by uh, misunderstanding, like I said, it's sort of the Romeo and Juliet of uh, French literature. You'll hear about them a lot. But Eloise and Abelard wrote a series of letters that fueled the romantic imagination. It became this huge deal. Meanwhile, um, and the main thing I wanted, actually I'm going to go back, the main thing I wanted to point out is, again, as the Archbishop of Canterbury is talking about honor and talking about uh, restoring God's honor, at the same time, uh, Peter Abelard is literally a victim of someone wanting to restore honor. So uh, you can understand why he suddenly is not too big a fan of that idea. So he continues teaching, and he begins to complain about Anselm and his theory. And his main complaint is exactly what I said was the complaint that it still is uh, with substitutionary atonement theory. That is, we focus too much on God's judgment. Um, Abelard took issue and it was a, basically he was offended because God was harsh and judgmental, um, angry, bloodthirsty, all of those critiques. So he went back and read scripture and took John 4, 16 as his guide. And he proclaimed, well, if we say in scripture, God is love, then he can't be the God who demands the death of his son. He can't be the God who is harsh and judgmental. It is antithetical to what Jesus teaches us of God, right? So he then says there with that quote on the bottom of the page, how cruel and wicked it seems that anyone should demand the blood of an innocent person as the price for anything. Still less that God should consider the death of his son so agreeable that by it he should be reconciled to the whole world. So that's, that's Abelard's, that's a direct quote. That's his effective complaint and concern about this whole theory. He goes on to say, in teaching us by word and example, even unto his death, he, that's Jesus, of course, has more fully bound us to himself by love, with the result that our hearts should be enkindled by such a gift of divine grace and true charity should not now shrink from enduring anything for him. So this is the heart of moral influence theory that Jesus, through his teaching and his, his healings and miracles, through everything in his life, through Jesus' entire life, he shows us a better way. And that if we then in turn respond um, in charity and grace to that, we can be healed without Jesus necessarily having to die for us. All moral influence theory. That is, Jesus' whole life is teaching us how to better love and respond to God's love. And the strength of this argument it's clear, all of Jesus' ministry matters, not, not just the cross, but his Jesus' entire life among us becomes important. So we don't throw out uh, the feeding of the 5,000. We don't throw out parables like the Good Samaritan. 
it all matters because that's how Jesus is teaching us how to be in better relationship with God and with our neighbor. And in healing, teaching, suffering, and dying, Christ so shows God's love for us that God becomes incarnate and chooses to suffer and to die to show us a better way. It's to inspire us to love God and our neighbor the way we should have done all along. In other words, before that, we all said it can't be done. Then Jesus shows, comes up and goes, no, you can do it. And then it happens. And, and it's proof that we can do it and we can be better. So here's the critiques of this theory. Um, and they're pretty straightforward. Uh, no theologian, William Placker, who's one of my favorite theologians, um, critiques the moral influence theory thus. This is his, a quote from him. Christ's suffering is supposed to work a change dramatically in us. We should look at ourselves and judge. But I do not find the results of such introspection encouraging. That is, we should just see all that Jesus does and then be able to fix all the stuff that is wrong with us. Um, and Blacker's basic thing is saying, I don't know that I can do that. I don't know that anyone can do that or anyone can live a perfect life just because Jesus lived a perfect life. Or that I even know what on earth I'm doing when I watch it. The other problem is Abelard's theory also still valorizes suffering. That is, Jesus revealed God's love by submitting to his death, by willfully dying. And so now it's humanity that should be inspired by suffering instead of God. So in substitutionary atonement theory, God sees Jesus' suffering and that sees that as the payment for sin. In this case, we're supposed to see Jesus' suffering and realize that we have um, hurt and injured God. Doesn't necessarily work that way, right? Is it much better? In either case, Jesus can only reveal God through suffering, or, or we can only be reconciled to God through suffering. So, Abelard taught his theory to all who would listen. Now, here's what happened real fast. This is a quick rundown of how this theory worked uh, or didn't work. It didn't sit well with Bernard of Clairvaux, who was perhaps the most powerful uh, monk in the land. Um, Clairvaux had something like a thousand monasteries related to it and working with him. So he was, in effect, the sort of shadow pope. Um, he did not like Abelard, and he did not like the new theory. He, he much preferred substitutionary atonement. So in 1141, uh, Bernard called a council of the church in sins, and uh, basically Abelard, not basically, he was declared a heretic, right, for this teaching. Abelard, thinking that this was personal, left and went to Rome. He was going to appeal directly to the Pope to hopefully get reinstated and not be declared a heretic. And so he went to Pope Innocent II, who served from 1130 to 1143 as Pope. And the thing that Abelard, I guess, didn't pay attention to was Pope Innocent had been elected under controversy. A small group of cardinals declared him Pope, while the majority elected another guy. So we're going to take a minute and look at how Pope Innocent became Pope. He was elected, but Pope Anacletus II was selected by a majority of cardinals and took control of Rome. So in other words, Pope Innocent II was the minority candidate, Anacletus II was a majority. So he was really the main choice. Pope Innocent fled to France, but Bernard of Clairvaux called the king of France and said, hey, take care of him. He's a good man. So the controversy ended when Anacletus II died in 1138. Pope Innocent II came back to his throne. So Abelard went to appeal to Innocent II against Bernard of Clairvaux, who had saved his life. Needless to say, it didn't go well. Um, Innocent owed everything to Bernard. Bernard had declared him a heretic, so Innocent backed him up. Um, he heard, the, uh, heard Abelard's plea but had him excommunicated as well as declared a heretic in uh, July 16th, 1142. So Abelard's not doing too well. Peter the Venerable, um, an abbot of Cluny, one of the main um, other leaders in the church of the day, asked, uh, told Abelard he could come to Cluny, to another, one of the major centers of learning in Europe in a monastic community, and just take refuge. Like, you've been declared a heretic, you've been excommunicated, but you can come and at least live your days here with the monks and be taken care of, like you learned at the stake. Um, Peter the Venerable then convinced Abelard to stay there, and in turn, he actually called Bernard, and they had a big conversation and reversed the excommunication. 
and basically in exchange for Peter's disdain for Abelard staying in Cluny, right? So Peter Abelard lived his days as a revered scholar and he died in 1142. Um, ironically enough, Abelard was revered as a brilliant man and a brilliant teacher. And even though all of this was happening with excommunications and being declared a heretic, people still, still thought very, very highly of him. And he had a hero's funeral, a huge state funeral um, at the end. Uh, anyway, even if the church was alternatingly angry at him. So that's Abelard, but what we try to separate now is moral influence theory and substitutionary atonement theory. These are the two main theories in the church, even up to today, almost everyone. And so conservative churches and movements um, will preach the substitutionary atonement theory. This is how it generally works. Um, if you're talking about evangelicals, the Baptist church, the Catholic church, um, all of them focus pretty heavily on substitutionary atonement theory. It's all what we've all heard a million times, right? Uh, Jesus died for your sins, um, and his suffering is our gain, those kinds of terminology that you will hear preached. Liberal churches and liberal movements, um, often enough the Episcopal Church is part of that, will preach the moral influence um, theory. That is, they will preach and teach and talk about um, how we are supposed to see all of God, all of Jesus's life as an example for us and how we're supposed to live a better life. And we know that Jesus is reconciled, uh, that we're reconciled through Jesus's life and death, but it's never as clear about how does that happen? How does that sin exchange happen where God redeems us? It, uh, it's easy in substitutionary atonement theory because we go, Jesus died to pay for our sins, therefore redeem. Moral influence theory is much more, Jesus lived among us, we're supposed to learn from him and grow, and through his whole life and existence, sin is taken care of. But it's not as clear because it doesn't have that exchange on the cross, right? But here's the interesting thing. Churches use both of these theories without thinking about the shadow sides. That is, they both, the liberal church and the conservative church, the liberal church will focus relentlessly and say what Jesus taught is what matters, but then we'll skip over exactly how sin is paid for, how we're reconciled to God. And then on the other side, on um, you know, a lot of those substitutionary atonement conservative communities, it's all about how Jesus died for you, but it's not eh, what he taught, what he said, sort of matters, not as much. It can it, It's secondary for the sin that is paid for on our behalf, and so things get sideways on that. It's an interesting process. So those are the major theories. Um, I'm going to look ahead real quick, and then I will, we'll go with questions. Next week, we'll look at the Christus Victor theory. Um, it's sometimes called the trick the devil theory. Uh, the idea behind that one, the quick idea, is that when we sin and fall, then the devil has control of us until Jesus comes and saves us, right? Um, so it's a, little, it's a different idea within that one, but it's another major theory of atonement. Um, and in the following week, we'll look at uh, what's called Girardian Atonement, and so we'll engage with that there. All right, I, I just threw literally everything at you. Um, I'm going to keep you all muted, muted just because no, everything comes through as clicks on my, my show here. <laughs> um, and so if you have a question, uh, just on the bottom of the page, you can click on chat. Um, and then ask questions within the chat room, and then I'll respond to those. But that's the basics today. I just literally went through in about 20, 30 minutes two major theories of atonement. So I'm sure you have thoughts or questions or um, clarification, all of the above. I'm happy to, happy to engage. So if you have any, feel free to ask. Everyone's got it all figured out. <laughs> um, while I'm waiting for y'all, for folks to type in, if there are anything else, um, I am going to share a couple of other quick things. One, um, again, congratulations to, it's actually Jacob is our bass singer. Alex is his wife. I got the names back backwards this morning, but congratulations to them uh, on the birth of their new child, their new baby. Um, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Glad, uh, glad to be a father and, and blessings to all of you for Grandparents, parents, everything in between. 
and, and blessings to all those who act as parents to us. Um, and then finally, uh, just a quick update on where we are with everything within um, the process of reopening. The diocese has sent out instructions for options to reopen. Um, there, there's lots of detail. I think I've said this in a couple of locations. There's lots and lots of detail within that, um, some 20 plus pages of instructions and rules to follow. The initial one um, that came out uh, for this says that you can only have 50 people in a worship service at a time. That's the phase one um, option, which means that between the 10 people that we ordinarily, nine to 10 people we have in an ordinary Sunday, that gives us 30 people who can come to be uh, participants. So we may end up waiting a little while to open until we have a larger opportunity to come. But again, we'll see. Um, we'll see how people feel safe and what they can do. Um, so John Harris just asked, how did uh, the substitutionary theory and moral atonement theories come about? Um, in both cases, uh, they were just trying to ask that fundamental question of how does Jesus save, right, John? They're, they're both groups, and this is what we've been doing for centuries, really. People are just trying to figure out, well, if we're sinful and broken and Jesus came to die for us, as it says in Scripture, died for us or died to reconcile us to God, what does that really mean? How does that work? What are the nuts and bolts and how does it fit together? And so the theories are an, a very human and fallen attempt to explain what God's doing to reconcile God to himself. Um, and what we are trying to do at best is to look at the width and breadth of scripture, but certainly the, the New Testament, but also including the Old Testament, how do we see this whole pattern of what God's doing to bring us into relationship with God? And the theories are out there like substitutionary theory and like moral um, influence theory. And they're close, but in both cases they have, and actually for all five of them that we're going to look at, all five have some great ideas and great ways you say, that sounds really good. And then you start to think about it and you go, oh, but there's some part that don't make sense within that, that we just have to wrestle with and try and figure out. All right, my friends. Well, maybe next week we can get the, uh, the audio to work, at least on my end. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone.